my my mo now is i get older and you, you know you attain a, a level of comfort with what you do that you can recreate this over and over again and do a good job especially when you're dealing with like a gorgeous model or handsome guys or a, a cool rock band you know i got this but um I really try to, no matter what the job is, reinvent myself or what, how I'm going to approach this. So it's not just like this, different clothing, different faces, mm -hmm. but there's some elements that are different. Or how can I find the, the different weird angle that I've never done before and, and make it a little different, push the envelope of creati creativity. And after many years of doing it, it's hard to, to recreate yourself, but that's what I strive for. That's what I really, uh, you know wake up and say okay how am i gonna make this a you know better day than yesterday or more you know different approach and re reinvent myself what's up everybody it's the poorly edited podcast guess what i hit everyone's mic except yours nice what's up everybody it's the poorly edited <laughs> podcast the show where we put a spotlight on some of the most creative minds as best as a call, uh, uh, you know, oh, it's like that. It's oh, like the intro. Wow. Zach, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing, Chandler. I'm doing great. Chandler, how are you doing I'm today? I'm doing fantastic. My name's Zach. You're going to catch up. You should up. ask me how I'm doing. How, how are you doing? I'm doing how, great. How's that, how's that threw, middle finger going there? How you there? threw me off my yeah. whole thing I'm with just your, scared. your failures <laughs> I've been doing the three audios, the audio inputs for so long. Yeah. Now that Zach has a mic, it just threw me off. We just so got hard. a new mic in yeah. the studio, which has apparently just train wrecked the entire production it's, instead I've of improved. unlearned everything. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I thought we just got a different board and the buttons were wider apart and he just, <laughs> he just slipped a little bit. But uh, we whatever. got we got Josh Brown on the camera, and we have a very special guest here with us today, Pete Gorniak. Hey, fellas! So uh, great to be here. Thank you guys are all really know. cool. Well, Thank let's you. not get carried away. All right, yeah, I won't say that here. on the air, but yeah, you, you guys are cool. <laughs> 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 let's let's wait until the end of the show, and then we can get yeah, the right, verdict right, and how yeah. cool we are. Uh, <laughs> we should do that every well, show. Yeah, like yeah. benchmark right when you meet us, and then at the end of the show, well, I was, see how it changes. I, I, I was going to say, I just stopped in to say, I got to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. That's it. I think that's time. So. <laughs> No, but so you're, uh, we know you from FIFO, at least. Uh, right. That's, that's where I Fade first, in, uh, fade out. Fade in, Film fade group. Out. Love that group. We just had Bill Harton on, yeah. actually. Oh, really? Like last week or two weeks ago or something like that. So, uh, yeah. I used him. In fact, the next FIFO meeting, we're going to air a music video that I produced. I should have brought a disc from uh, the Dave Goddess group that I'm doing a lot of promotional work with. And I used Bill as one of the characters in the music video. So we're going to play it. It's really funny. It's funny. He plays a judge. Nice. Yeah. I mean, he seems yeah. pretty good for that role. Yeah. 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 And it's like a three minute song. So it's not going to be like a painful 20 minute thing. <laughs> yeah. Like some of those speeches, I don't know if you were at the last one, they are like, bah, 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 bah. Yeah. okay, already. <laughs> Next, please. At wow. FIFO. Yeah, so FIFO's a great group. <laughs> yeah. I made a lot. Of I was gonna, I was gonna say it's the first negative thing I've ever heard anybody say about it. So, well, I that's a good accolade to have. <laughs> <laughs> the first FIFO hater. No, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. The mingling part is is great, and there's a lot of really yeah. talented people there. Yes. I've worked on a couple different productions with with the crew people. Which is sometimes when they they talk about last year and what's going on, yeah. they use too many adjectives, and they they just should abbreviate and get to the point and get out. So is that that's your style for sure? Yeah. Is more I, succinct. I'm working on that. Yeah. Yes, yes, and and, and yeah, it's a, it's a, actually a, a conscious effort that I have made since doing a lot of corporate meetings back in the day when I was doing big corporate production. It was like have your agenda, get to the point, stick to the point, mm -hmm. get you know, get some feedback. Next point. Yeah, but have that agenda and drive the the yeah. meeting, the conversation. I feel like a lot of people think that just being able to talk forever is good. I think it's even harder to just talk for the right amount of time yeah. and just have everything said. And make a point, yeah. you know, and say something. Man, he's good with that yeah, camera. Yeah, like, you see him whip that whip <laughs> zoom, man. Over the, I think it's doing permanent damage to his wrist, though. <laughs> <laughs> see that, that, last one? One? <laughs> that was a good whip. <laughs> Uh, Pat, we'll talk about after the show the direct shot that you took at me about being too verbose in our in our meetings. That could have been at anyone until you wow, took ownership yeah, well, of it. It seemed tar it seemed pointed, but um, so your is your main uh, title. How would you? Yeah, it's funny. I just got a compliment on this. It was on, on my LinkedIn mm -hmm. uh, thing. I said main guy at petergorniak.com. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, main but guy. but years ago when I. 
I still have AOL, you know. Nice. My my title on on uh, AOL is uh, Supreme Commander. <laughs> That's funny. What did uh, what did Lewis call himself? Overlord. Overlord. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's a little over the top. Yeah. <laughs> you don't. That's say. a step above Supreme Commander. Yeah. I'd say. Yeah. Uh, so you do a lot of photography. Yeah. Right You're now. Really active in the film scene. Yeah. I'm I'm trying to really transition uh, uh, almost everything that I do from you know commercial fashion photographer uh commercial marketing video guy into film and entertainment documentary style i have a whole uh catalog of concepts that could go into production immediately i'm starting my new production company is going to be artica content studios nice yeah and i'm working on a really fabulous studio but i'm i'm actually going into production on my first short movie that i wrote like seven or eight mo uh years ago and it's really exciting it's, it's a challenge but it's exciting so getting back to you know my main thing i'm trying to actually shift my focus and monetize artwork my paintings uh art photography because i've had some great opportunities to be in these like inside of the blast furnaces at bethlehem steel for weeks i had keys i wasn't supposed to be shooting but i mm -hmm. i had my camera with me because i was going to the job yeah, site i had to so go through to, just so happened to yeah. spend hours and hours <laughs> in there <laughs> shooting Buttons some got press <laughs> yeah. just yeah. happened to be in the right direction and then i happened to print them out real big on <laughs> aluminum and they're all for sale <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, so, but what, what a what a uh, happenstance, happenstance yeah. though. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, just think the the these stars aligned yeah. in exactly yeah. the right way, and I'm an artist. <laughs> so, so how'd so you get in there to begin with, though? Yeah, who gave you the keys? Well, I was actually hired Wait, by. It was keys like a is key like you mean like a crowbar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was about this big. <laughs> No, I was hired by the company that built what's called the Hoover Mason Trestle. If you know what that is, it goes along the blast furnace. It's a big right, okay. walkway, kind of like the High Line in New York City. And there's kiosks to tell you what's going on in the steel at this point when you're there. So they hired me to do a visual time study of the building of the trestle, which was exciting by That's itself. Cool. You know, and I had a really great perspective from there into steel. But before they built the stairways going up into it, they we had I had to literally go inside the blast furnace crawl over through a bunch of stuff and go up a wooden ladder to get to the job location. Is that a new wooden ladder or is that like an original Well, that ladder? was like aluminum probably, okay. but it was treacherous up there because you're yeah. probably 30 feet above mm. street level. I lost two hard hats because it was a hard hat area, steel tips and hard hats on, on the job as a union thing. So, uh, yeah, you know, I would like go in, I'd look around. It was like a kid in a candy store. I would run up, do what I had to do for the client, which was really cool as well because it was video and still. So I had to have a, a serious pack of equipment. But then I'd get down and I would just get lost in there. And it's like a ghost town. You know, you, you know, guys are every year is a stupid number of people dying and melting to death, you know, with these uh, molten steel the rivers and stuff and the blast furnaces they would actually bring the core in and drop it down into a you know a basement with a conveyor belt that would take it all the way up the side of the um blast furnace and dump it in well these things were on burning ore for years you know because when they clean them out you have to turn it uh, shut them down for months so that's my bethlehem steel story that's that sounds pretty sick. I'm not gonna lie. Dude. Yeah, we were there the other day, and we're like, yeah. I wish we could go inside and check it out. Yeah, so, yeah. That's it's awesome. amazing. It. And when you think about what the heck was going on there, and how things are rusting, and and they and now they put all the beautiful LED colored lights up because it's better to dress it up and light it up than tear it down. Mm. Cost probably billions. Yeah. But yeah, so I I had some clients uh, from the silk mill project. Uh, uh, so industrial residential thing in Easton the developers saw some of that and I was like hey it's all for the sale and they're like hey could you come to our location and shoot that kind of stuff and print it out for the hallways of they have like 350 really cool uh, loft apartments mm -hmm. so yeah that's uh, you know what I'm trying to transition I think it looks like March mid end of March depending on the weather we're going to shoot this movie and I'm really trying to like I said work more as a crew guy because mm -hmm. i'm known like in major markets like new york city philly as a, a predator where they would hire somebody to produce a video they'd have a, a an art director a, a shooter an editor a, a titles guy a sound guy lighting guy 
I produce, I direct with a camera in my hand, a lot, lot like that guy. <laughs> and then, I'll, you know, I'll write the script in a corporate situation, get it approved by the client, <laughs> shoot it all. I don't do serious motion graphics myself. I outsource that, but I'll do all the editing, sometimes even play music. Ed, ed, hence the, the term producer editor. I take the place of like five guys. So on a set, I'm very versatile. I can do sound, I can I do lighting, I understand the camera works. I can be assistant camera or main camera. And I, I even actually started to cross the line and audition. I have this a funny story I've got to tell real quick. I auditioned for a TV commercial a couple of weeks ago, and it was like a, it was a guy swinging an axe, and they didn't have a real axe there. It was kind of a comical kind of thing. So I guess the the head flew off the axe in the real commercial. I didn't get the job. But he gave me a stick and there was a piece of wood on a glass table and he said, just swing with, you know, and then end with this like expression like this axe is coming at you. And he said, whatever you do, don't hit the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You guessed it. <laughs> First swing, I'm like, oh, I got this, man. Whoops. I hit the table. <laughs> Didn't break. So, luckily, uh, but... what, what, what was, the, how was the room? <laughs> what's what's it like help? getting kicked out of my <laughs> <laughs> It was, the funny thing was, I, it, you know, it was like a line, uh, you know, they had to approve you to go even mm -hmm. do the, the read for it. But I knew so many of the people in there from working on this side of the mm -hmm. camera mm -hmm. um, that were auditioning. And they're like, I didn't know you do. You're an actor. I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> I did plays in high school, man. <laughs> <laughs> of course I'm an actor. Was that kind of your roots then? Into getting kind of into arts and entertainment? It, you know, in high school, I'm talking like mid-70s. Yeah. I I was like this guy. I had a hair down in the middle of my back. And, and school was different back then. We had a smoking area. We were moving yeah. towards open ha campus in high school. Mm -hmm. Until, I mean, it, it just got tighter and tighter with... Um, you know, restrictions, but um, I had a weird background. My dad was a pretty serious alcoholic, so I didn't spend that much time at home. We had this little clique of guys that were all, you know, badasses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Drugs were crazy back then, and it was like, you know, even though I played sports and did theater, I was like with that gang, you know what I mean? <clears throat> but um, I had a homeschool art teacher who was, he was a religious guy, but he was brilliant. And he, he really uh, was passionate about um, like Renaissance artwork, like, like uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And he, and he instilled that in my brain somehow. And I would go in there and just for an hour, we'd paint and he'd say, this is what this is. And then I did my last two years, I went to Botech at uh, three to six o'clock uh, to commercial art uh, for two semesters or two years. And that was three hours a day of illustrating, photo, photography, yada, yada. And this guy was like, back then, he would carry a purse. He had a handlebar mustache, and he was funny as hell. But he also taught me at an early age, and I'm not going to go into the specific story, but he really taught me to look at life in detail, and especially when I'm shooting something, or to, to really go into the, even the origins of what it is I'm looking at or photographing or videotaping rather than just the two-dimensional kind of view of it. Look into the world behind it. What brought this thing to right here? So he and, and that teacher taught me really, and I didn't even know it back then, but how to pre-visualize work. So if I'm going to do a group shot of you guys, you know, I know you're fun, cool, kooky dudes, man. <laughs> That's going to be the, the, the video. Like, you know, maybe you're all taking selfies of each other or something like that. And that's your promotional video because you, you want to capture the essence of the person or the object or the thing. And, you know, I've had to do, I've worn the art director's hat many times when clients or smaller businesses, they don't have a budget to hire an, uh, an ad agency, but they need this video or they need this website or something done. So you really, I try and put myself into the, their target market, you know. If I'm their customer or the customer they want, what do I want to see regarding their project or how they position themselves? Mm -hmm. So it really, you know, going back to high school, I didn't really realize it then until I started reading and getting more into, to, you know, working commercially. You know, this sense of pre-visualization is how I roll. I, I um, go into almost any situation and I'm looking at it, taking pictures in my head, thinking I'm going to use this camera, I'm going to use this background, this thing. 
and then it becomes kind of easy. And then if you're working with like, like a model who really is a, an experienced model, I've got the background, foreground, the dress, the makeup, but man, if she's like really a great at moving and good at fluid in her movement and knows her own angles, <clears throat> it becomes fun, mm -hmm. you know, because then it's like, you gotta be an idiot to take a bad picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I had one experience where I got to work with somebody who had actually like had that a little bit of experience like it's that. A pleasure. And it's like, it's totally different compared to just like shooting candidates. It somebody is. Or something and I think like it with people uh, and a lot like you guys, it's not even so much the experience, but just being comfortable in your own skin yeah. and fluid in your movement uh, cause there is no right or wrong. There's certain, you know, poses in modeling, the standards that you work from and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And the Charlie walk and how to jump in the air. And, you know, when you smile, your whole body's happy, <laughs> even though you don't see a lot of it. <laughs> but yeah, so, so it, it really started with me at a very young age. And, you know, I went through a lot of different things out of high school. I was promoting concerts and working with one of the biggest concert promoters in the area. And in the summertime, we were working with, you know, like every big hair band. And I got to nice. hang out with Sting a little bit. I almost went on the road with Kiss, but I just, I didn't want to go on the road with a bunch of smelly drug addicts, you know? <laughs> it's like... Hey. That's understandable. Gene Simmons didn't do that much. Drugs. No, the crew. The crew. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't speak for them. Yeah, can't. <laughs> I, if I can't say anything nice about people, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mention Gene Simmons. And... Well, he's not. A... You went off on <laughs> FIFO. He's so. a great guy. But... <laughs> Chown's actually best friends with Gene Simmons. Yeah, yeah, that's my dad. And Paul Stanley. Yeah. And pa Ace Freely. They're Paul Stanley. <laughs> I'm surprised you could name that many no. Kiss members. <laughs> yeah. I like Kiss. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, I do. Wait, so you make fun of me for my music taste? Yeah, but you for sure. Yeah, but right. I don't go around talking about it, you know? <laughs> I don't go around. Like, I just discovered Kiss in 2019, you know? Wow. Uh, yeah, they're probably doing their fifth farewell tour. Yeah. The <laughs> this time for real. The farewell yes, tour. Yes, we're really going this time. and We're going with full makeup. <laughs> <laughs> the makeup's back on. <laughs> I, I w worked a couple months ago, or a year or two ago now, at the PPNL Center. I was the staff photographer for a while, and I did. Um, I shot Judas Priest, and I had the pleasure of working with them back in the day when they were young, mighty guys, before Rob Halford came out of the closet as a the king of queens or whatever they call him. Uh, but it was funny because he was like working working on this cane to get up to the stage. And once he got up there, he was good. The band was tight and everything like that. But man, it was like scary getting Yeah. Old. You kind of wish they'd just maybe pack it in. Yeah. Just right. for the image, just to preserve the... Well, well you know? it's also, you know, if you're selling to big crowds, it's a huge source of revenue for them. Yeah. You know, because I, I don't you know, don't people don't them. buy records anymore. The money in the, that business is in playing out if yeah. you're drawing people, if you're selling tickets. That's the, really where the money is now. For sure. So, yeah, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Should we give him a mic for a minute? Or yeah, do you yeah, want to say want anything? Josh, <laughs> how, how are you, dude? <laughs> yeah, Josh, yo, you're so quiet over there, man. Goodness, you look I scared. Was not expecting this. Josh, <laughs> believe it or not, we actually have a fifth mic I can wire up. <laughs> yeah. I'm, not even, I'm not even joking. Like We actually have We're one. We're going to bring Pete in here and live wire. Yeah. <laughs> I think I would have to run and grab another XLR or something. But, or no, I don't. That's right. There. Uh, he can just talk loud. Yeah. yeah. We'll all be quiet. <laughs> Pete, there's so many things that you talked about that you did that I'd love to 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 delve into, but I feel like I don't know if we have the t like I mean just <laughs> the idea of like fashion photography I find fascinating and I'm sure has so much nuance to it. As, it's as it's, to it's weird because when I was in high school, mm -hmm. I used to subscribe to like French Vogue. I was just really into the art of it, and back then, you know, if you didn't. You were a model. You didn't pose nude. You were an idiot. You know what I mean? So it was a lot of nude stuff going on in, in like the late 70s, early 80s. But it was art. The photography was just amazing. And then, you know, of course, they're all gorgeous girls and stuff like that. But um, I didn't really start shooting until long way down the road, especially fashion. I happened to be uh, share a studio in my production company with a guy named Paul Pellick, who was a really great photographer back in the day. He would shoot all the Hesses, Young Miss, Junior mm -hmm. Colonies, Izod. And we ended up sharing a studio that was like a floor away from each other. And um, <clears throat> 
he always had these gorgeous models in and out doing portfolio work, bikini stuff. So I would make any excuse that I could to go <laughs> visit him. I'm like, Paul, you have any coffee I could borrow? And like five <laughs> minutes later, I'd be like, well, I need some sugar for this. And <laughs> It's a good so, coffee. You get like three trips out yeah, of that. You, you get, get coffee, like, sugar, <laughs> creamer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the right bathroom on my out. floor isn't working anymore. So, <laughs> so, so I would lo- love, and he was building big sets. It was really a production, this guy. He was like one of the bigger commercial photographers at the time. And we became really good buddies. <clears throat> I just shot something with his daughter yesterday, I mean Friday. And um, so then when I started taking pictures, because I was booking a lot of entertainment at the time, and it was a weird time in Lehigh Valley where this one guy who had a modeling agency was running, getting, had to leave town for tax evasion and nice. lawsuits with little girls or something like that. And then there was Jan Nagy, who God, God bless her, uh, her idea of modeling was teaching girls to walk and balance books on their head. It wasn't really like an agency, but there was all this business at the time. And I had already been booking bands and entertainment in all these different venues. It's the same principle of being an agent. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'm going to get a few smart people together and start Allure Models. Mm -hmm. And I had Paul was one of my main shooters and I did really good for two years, but I was going insane. It was like yeah. you're in the middle of clients who want Kate Moss for 10 bucks an hour and you got these whiny prissy models who only care about hairspray and booby adjusters and mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It was like being in the middle was killing me. Yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> I so I slowly fizzled out but I did good and I made a lot of <laughs> really gorgeous friends. <laughs> And as I transitioned out, I started just messing around doing portfolio work with some of these girls. And I, they taught me as much as I did them. But when I would go, I'd shoot a, a couple rolls. Mm-hmm. Back then it was 35 millimeter film. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and um, I'd go down and talk to Paul. I'd show him I'm real excited about this work and had perfect lighting. And he's like, that's nah, stupid. I, <laughs> I, I can't use the words I really want to use, but this go, that, I don't know. Here's, here's something. This is okay. You see where you're going with this? Compositionally, mm-hmm. you can see her eyes clearly. There's no shadows and the form is nice. This is why this is good. And this is terrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but did that help to that get us in the great though to immensely. have yeah. somebody I, like that right next to you working every day? And we're still famous friends. He's yeah. in Florida now and he still shoots once in a while and um you know, we're just still best buddies because we went through so much stuff and, you know, wherever we get a chance to throw each other a, a job or work together, we do it. But um you know, he's pretty far away and uh but yeah, like I think he taught me, well, definitely in, uh, in critiquing my work, my photos, what not to do mm-hmm. and what to look for. Yeah. And, <clears throat> but now, you know, I mean, <clears throat> people think there's a set specific thing. And my, my MO now is I get older and, y- you know, you attain a, a level of comfort with what you do that you can recreate this over and over again and do a good job, especially when you're dealing with like a gorgeous model or handsome guys or a a cool rock band, you know, I got this, but, um, I really try to, no matter what the job is, reinvent myself or what, how I'm going to approach this. So it's not just like this, different clothing, different faces, Mm -hmm. but there's some elements that are different or how can I find the, the different weird angle that I've never done before and, and make it a little different, push the envelope of creativity. And after many years of doing it, it's hard to, to recreate yourself, but that's what I strive for. That's what I really, uh, you know, wake up and say, okay, how am I going to make this a, you know, better day than yesterday or more, you know, different approach and re- reinvent myself. That's yeah. probably how you last that long in the business yeah. is doing something new not getting burnt out. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, referrals. Cause I think a big part of my approach to photography, I, I, I used to shoot only people. I know that doesn't sound right. It's like <laughs> I shoot people, <laughs> I photograph only people, but because you know, I've refined this art of no matter who it is, a corporate executive, a politician, a gorgeous 15 year old girl who's like nervous. I, I disarm them and I really become their friend and, 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 uh, trying to find things they like, things we can relate to. So it's just two friends hanging out. I don't care if it's a five year old kid or, 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 or an 80 year old politician, I'll get into their heads, get to be their best friend. And the shoot goes so much easier because my mission really <clears throat> is and I say this a lot when I talk to younger kids is not 
just to take pretty pictures. But, you know, if I shoot you guys um, and we have a fun time and the pictures turn out great and you're using them and people compliment you on them and this and that. And, 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 and. But 10 years down the road, <clears throat> when you look at it, my mission is to say it's for you guys to say or a model or a rock band or anything. Look at that and say, you know, it's a great. I was pretty handsome, but that freaking weirdo photographer dude we had so much fun that yeah, day it yeah. was an experience you know and it's part of the quality of the photographs is you get this real expression or emotion real out of atmosphere your yeah that was positive yeah, yeah. years ago i i got to tell a quick story because this is funny there was this girl she was must have been 16 and i'm at queen city airport had this style shoot and she just wasn't moving around or working with me but she had a leather jacket leather glasses bomber glasses a scarf that was blowing in the wind we had an old b-52 bomber blown out of focus in the background and nice. i'm laying on the runway lines thinking oh man I, I'm, I'm loving this but she was just like yeah, <laughs> she wasn't working with me. I remember it so well. My my niece at the time must have been ten or eleven years old. She was holding the reflector, <laughs> and I'm shooting film at the time. And I was like, "Man, I got to nail this. This is like a book shot for me. Everything's perfect except mm -hmm. her." So I put the camera down. I was like, "Okay, I'm going there." I put the camera down. And I said, "Look, I don't know why we're bothering. You're not working with me. You're just you're just sitting there. I mean, I need emotion. I need hang." And she started clenching her fists and doing this weird stuff with her face. And she's like hyperventilating. I pick up the camera and I'm like, click, 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 nice. click, 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 click. I load another roll really quickly and she's still freaking out. And I was like, calm down. I was only kidding. I just needed to get a reaction. And she threw her head back and started laughing. And I'm like, click, 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 yes. click, 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 click. Because always, you know, in my position, when I'm clicking a lot, I'm feeling it. Because if I'm shooting something, I'm not feeling it. I'm, I'm going to put my camera down and think this through because what's the point? I'm Especially always with film. It's yeah. Like you have yeah. a limited amount. Absolutely. You got to go for that one to one ratio. Mm. I'm not going to click unless I'm feeling it or yeah, I, because, you know, I can kind of see through the production process. So the whole, the, the moral of that little story is I literally had to piss this girl off. Yeah. <laughs> and I did. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there's so many cool, like, little things about portrait photography like that, whether it's like acting a certain way to get a certain performance out of somebody or even just like figuring out different ways to capture a moment and making sure that they're how that you want them to be mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's to me it's so much more exciting than any other kind of photography for that reason it, it is when you're working with models or people it's always the unexpected that you end up using you know it, it, it's the uh the it turns out the best that you just kind of had this last minute thought about it um but yeah i you know uh the the point also is you know when you're shooting something whether it's for the model the client yourself what you sometimes you just got to do whatever it takes to get the shot yeah. you know what i mean like i thought long and hard about just having okay shots with this girl like mm, i'm a pretty girl on a runway and t instead of like yeah, i own that plane i fly that sucker and you know yeah, yeah, which yeah. is really what what i got out of her being mad you know yeah that's rad yeah that's a rad story actually i really like that so you seem to have, I mean, obviously you've been doing this for a long time and you talked about your mentors, you talked about, I mean, you've already, I think, said a lot of things that are very useful in terms of, you know, some of the insight that you've gathered over the years. But um, you, are you interested in, you know, passing on, you know, that kind of... It's funny you should say that because I'm really trying, I, I had a, I never really liked talking in front of people and mm -hmm. things like that. But I feel like now uh, I really enjoy, I did a couple of speaking things. I, I won an arts ovation award for lifetime achievement in visual arts. And the acceptance thing was kind of exciting because mm -hmm. it it's not a, you pay and you, you submit work and then they judge it. Somebody nominates you in the car, art community who uh, Bill Childs nominated me and it really caught me by surprise he's an art director forever he ran the whole advertising division at the morning call and we never really were friends until about two or three years ago i knew of him he knew of me but we never really became friends so you know we started working on things together and and yada yada and he nominated me and then i i won the award so really took the acceptance speech in it to heart and really wanted to show more versatility than a photographer yeah. video guy so in my acceptance speech 
I made a reference and I use this part of it when I do like speaking engagements for kids or, you know, like middle school kids, or I, I would really love to speak to the graduating bow tech class yeah. because I went through the program. But, uh, I went to bow tech as well in high school. Did you? Programming. Yeah. yeah. So it's an important, uh, very important institution. Yeah. You know, and I, and I just got, you know, this whole kind of to condense it, uh, about, um, you know, at any age, any level, whatever business or thing you do in life, my paintings are always these blown out sparks and like uh, fireworks kind of things, whether it's mixed media. But to me, and I've just come to terms with it this year, it's the search for the elusive spark of inspiration. Where the hell does that come from? How yeah. do you get that? How do you get it? And But my, the point of my speeches were because I had this kid... Uh, when I first started painting like 20 years ago, this was after painting in high school, I thought, you know, I'm going to, it's good therapy. I've got this creative monsters that got to come out in different medias. I'm going to do the short story, but this kid is a very successful painter in New York. Now he looked at my work and he's like, you know what? I see what you're doing. This is cool. He said, he said, I, I love what you're doing, but you know what? This is like so much two weeks later, you didn't get much done. He's like, don't be afraid, man. Dive in. doesn't matter what people think because my stuff is all abstract. You know, it's subjective. So you either like it or you don't. And I don't care if people don't like it because it's it's, it's about me. And then I, I say, um, you know, he was just like, dive in. It doesn't matter what people think. You can gesso over the canvas and start over if you don't like it. And I was like, okay, good advice. But I said, wait a minute. He called me afraid. He said, I was afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, condensing what I speak about to younger kids is if you are lucky enough to get inspired by something, whether it's music, poetry, photography, anything, embrace it, grab it and, and invest in it, you know, invest yourself into it. Don't uh, don't let that inspiration just pass you by. You, see, you, know? you said if you're lucky enough to be inspired, I, like know, it's... I mean, it's a privilege to be able to feel that way about something. It is. And with me, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because, you know, I'm in this mode of life where I have a lot less time going forward than behind me. So I want to make every minute count. And to me, I always have to be making something. Um, so, you know, I, I have three or four paintings going on at the same time and I'll work on this for a couple of days. We then go to this or this. I own eight guitars or nine guitars and I play, try and play a little every day. And, um, but so that inspiration, I'm very inspired. So it's like, I don't feel right unless I'm creating something right. somehow. I have notepads everywhere in my house where I'll have half of a poem here and here. I'm not kidding when I say I have a stack this high of half finished songs and, and, uh, uh, poems, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them are in the computer, but most of them are, are out here. I uh, fantasize about doing a poetry book, like pretty pictures and poems by yeah. Peter or something like that. <laughs> that's pretty, that's it's a like, lot of alliteration there. Title right. It's pretty good. I dig that. <laughs> I've been thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good tip though. If anyone out there wants to do anything creative, just have a notepad or something to write down. Well, have like, those things available. To yeah. yeah. Grab your camera. Like you Even just your on your phone. Have all of it around. Because, I mean, yeah. you can get an idea, and you'll be like, oh, remember this. And then yeah, you're like, you terrible. sit down with a guitar, and you're like, wow, what was it? Yeah. Ah. That's the worst. Yeah. That's the worst. I have short videos of me playing when I write a little uh, melody line or something like that, or a chord progression. I'll, I'll record myself. Yeah. And I've got piles of half-written songs or verse, <laughs> bridge, chorus, and no, you know, mm. one day. Yeah, the voice <laughs> memo for a phone, amazing tool. Yeah. I love it. It's an amazing I love it. tool for that. I was watching... Airspace Live did an episode with Matt Mulchaney that did a mm -hmm. podcast and uh, Chris Garcetti said the same thing where he's like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let anyone listen to my voice memos because it's like a portal like into my brain, yeah. and, like, into my heart where it's like so personal that, Mine, uh, mine's like that too. Yeah. Well, where it's yeah, like, it's, it's, really be very, it's very vulnerable experience to show <laughs> someone your voice memos in your phone just because it's like, it's like purely what you're thinking. Like, yeah. There's no obstruction. And let's re just release them all. Let's yeah, just, let's just put do them it. all on a drive and just <laughs> <laughs> send it. Um, so no, I mean, I, I honestly, I think, I think that's profound. I think that's an important thing to to latch on to, and I think that's a really important. While it, it is almost just one singular piece of the puzzle, which is mm -hmm. being creative and, and creating things, I think it is 
such an important one that to instill that <clears throat> onto you know younger people and those that you talk to is mm-hmm. really important. <clears throat> Absolutely, and I think uh, the more you do anything, the more of that part of your brain that you use, uh, you develop a sort of muscle memory, and you critique yourself, and you you get better at it. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's playing an instrument or poetry, uh, you know, even taking pictures. Yeah, you know, I'm constantly looking at stuff in the magazines and trying to figure out how they caught that or is it photoshop is it yeah. you know time lapse is yeah. it does and now you know with people's attention spans getting shorter and shorter um there's a lot of um open distribution channels for short form video like do you, you guys tick tock at all yes do i'm in I, i'm sucked in i'm i'm a, more of a stalker i put two videos up and uh-huh. i'm planning a couple yeah <laughs> but at my age they have to be stupid cool yeah, yeah or shut be, up yeah. you know <laughs> Because there are some people that are old that just don't belong on there. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and, and uh, like, um, uh, I even feel too old yeah. sometimes when I post a TikTok. I'm like, I, I'm not cool. Like, I pull it up and like, like half my likes were from like, like, 13 year old kids and yeah, this is weird i gotta find <laughs> find you guys yeah i have a couple of, i only probably have like 40 followers yeah. or something like that <laughs> yeah. but i follow a lot of people that just are so funny like i get i'm like a certain part of my day i feel like i've got to spend 10 minutes updating you know my tiktok views you know yeah, and, yeah. and a lot of the really good jokes i'll save them you know what yeah. I mean? And, and and i'll regurgitate that in my life you know <laughs> <laughs> so tiktok i think think you know when i first got on tiktok i was like oh i like you know, just like vine was when that was really popular it's it's an interesting medium because it, it puts some restrictions onto what you have to do which ends up creating thing people have to be more creative with what they're doing in order for it to be and good. it's like what i was talking about earlier when i was in the corporate world it's like they they make a point or tell a joke Mm -hmm. and a lot of them are so brilliant in the way they rotate. They seamlessly just uh, revolve, you know? Uh, So to get and creatively make a point or tell a little story in 15 seconds, it freaks me out. Yeah. It totally freaks me out. It's like the coolest thing because, you know, in advertising, it's like, Oh, you want to come up with the, the Nike just to do it slogan, or you want to, nail that meme that people are just going to relate to in the mm-hmm. deepest part of their soul and tiktok i've i've seen that's crazy five-year-old yeah. kids do it yeah exactly <laughs> that's actually a very Maybe. valuable skill to actually have and i don't know if people realize that they're honing in on that so I, your cat i don't your think your cat tackles it pretty well my, my cat is <laughs> huge oh really yeah. really huge. let me ask you something do they monetize that at all i, I mean, don't this, think there's a way you can monetize i think it's TikTok i think yet. they're you got to go to youtube thinking about it yeah. i think they're trying to figure it out yeah. it's going to be probably I've like it, it's going to be like uh you know any platform when it first comes out and it's <laughs> and it's uh, Stop, Josh. it's a bit weird to figure out how to monetize yeah, every, it first. every time it's like yeah. they're like we're just going to put it up anyone can use it whatever man and yeah. like, <laughs> it's like how do we make money off this <laughs> Yeah, well, it's a lot of the startups are like that, yeah. you know, and then they figure out how to wing in the advertising mm-hmm. and stuff. And I mean, God, look at Facebook. They own the world now, yeah. you yeah. know. Um, same with Google. It's like they didn't know how to monetize it when they first came up, but now they're b- b- billions a day. Yeah. Um, so who's the funniest person on TikTok? You know, there's a there's a, a mom and a daughter, uh, they're Asian, that I, that I like. It's Tiffany and Joy, and they have a, a YouTube channel again, and this kid is like four years old and um i i should pull it up but um you know they're they're just so funny and such great actors and so charismatic mm-hmm. and they they just pick the right shtick to yeah, to yeah. copy or what do you call it the challenges yeah yes like you've got this sound bed and you've got to do your own interpretation of it I, I they're so funny and cute as hell and you see a lot of other moms and daughters and they just don't have the, the chemistry exactly yeah, and yeah. the and the the pull it off like we don't take ourselves too seriously. Mm-hmm. Like this is all about fun, but they, they get, I'm sure they're over five, 6,000 uh, followers and growing. Mm-hmm. 
I can't tell you how many times I've been like in a bar or something like that. And I was like, oh, you got to see this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Tiffany and Julia. But they're like, you're weird, man. <laughs> <laughs> I also love TikTok because of the music part of it. Yeah, oh, it's, it's incredible. Like, it's so married to music mm-hmm. and sound, and I, which is something I, unlike any other platform. It's actually, the platform has launched a lot of really cool songs that you would have never heard of if it wasn't for a challenge and on TikTok. I love TikTok. that. Me yeah. too. There's Me so too. many songs it's where brilliant. I'm like, oh, that's so great. And I can't tell you how many like kids or people that I follow that are just doing some really cool guitar work yeah. and it, it loops, you know what I mean? So, uh, I just think it's the future of, of delivering information, you know, For and, sure. and you know, you, there's a lot of crap. There's you know, again, yeah. so many people my age that think, Oh, prove my daughter wrong and get 20,000 likes on this. I'm like, get yeah. a life, you know, <laughs> go back to Facebook and MySpace. <laughs> Yeah, whenever there's no, there's basically no barrier to entry to get on a platform. There's like fifty percent of it's just garbage. Yeah, like just from the get go. Like everything we put out. Yeah, like, like it's TikTok. like anyone. Can, yeah, it's like anyone can do it. So it's What's not, our garbage ratio? You think yeah. it's fifty percent on TikTok? <laughs> no, just uh, oh, oh, in general. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Josh's TikToks. I was a big fan of. Josh, Josh did you have a TikTok? TikTok? Yeah, we had, a, <laughs> we had a solid day where all we did was conceptualize and film TikToks and I I never that. did it again, I think. I wasn't part of any of that at all. I was just I slow. Kept, no, I, was just, I kept making yeah. them. I was slowly building up Melon's uh, TikTok yeah. empire. <laughs> he has like And then when the cat got views. more followers than us, I was like, ah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know? yeah. We were putting effort I'm in. A, I'm a dog person, though. <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah, I always look at the dog videos. There's some amazing, amazing dog clips on there. Is, that, yeah. I don't, is there an art to making Melon adorable or is it just turn the camera on, he's, throw a song on there? He's pretty adorable and it's easy with cats, especially when they're kittens. Yeah, it's just not so, fair, yeah. honestly. Yeah, I mean, but, and he has like weird quirks too. Like he went through a phase where he would just constantly like go under your blanket uh, and then or like under anything, like under a laptop or under a blanket or under a pillow. So Sam just like made a compilation of her just like opening things and he was there every time then that was huge so it's and then playing off of the songs or like the little sound yeah, bite right, yeah. some of those are just inherently funny mm-hmm. so if you put anything like remotely related to it it's just funny and it's different so you get views but sam's actually the mastermind behind she that is yeah 100%. i did very little so i've Getting off TikTok, yeah. I'm sure we're all sorry to do. Yeah, yeah well, I, can't, I didn't so, think it was going to go that direction. I'm so when you, I'm that. excited. When you started taking pictures, you said you used film, right? Mm-hmm. So when I like I recently started doing photography, I'm not very good at it, but it was like, part. and the nice part was like, with these cameras, it's like, you can just take a million pictures and one of them is probably going to be all right. Yeah. So like when getting into it, was there like... Like, is that a bigger deal? Yeah, like you shot on continuous a lot at first. Yeah. I was like, don't do that. No, you that's know? exactly the opposite <laughs> right. of my approach. Right. So, so when I think of a job or something or shooting something, even an animal or something like that, I'm looking at it through my camera before I even pick up my camera. I'm thinking, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to get super tight. I'm going to blow everything out of focus in the background. Um, so there was, in high school, there was... Uh, the, I'm reading the dialogues of Leonardo da Vinci, the, the notebooks right now. But this is because I was kicked in the pants in high school about how cool this dude was yeah. and what a mathematical genius he was, inventor, artist. He was a funny guy, too. And you look at his readings, he's he's funny. Um, he would steal cadavers and dissect them. And up to like 10 years ago, his drawings were in every anatomy school until they got really good at 3D animation yeah. and <laughs> stuff like that that they have now. It was... Um, you know, Gray's Anatomy. And um, so, you know, I'll look at a subject or something like that and I'll be thinking more about the technical end of how to approach what I want to do. So, you know, you set up the shot in your head and, um, and then you take a picture and look at it and say what's good or what's bad about it. So Da Vinci's teachings were, um, if I remember correctly, it was like perceive form whatever you're shooting your mm-hmm. subject in the utmost detail in depth. If you're painting or shooting clearly indicate the dominant planes. And then the third point that he gets across is all of life flows from the center outward, mm-hmm. which is a reference to the golden mean, the theory of mm-hmm. what aesthetically makes things pleasing. The golden it, ratio. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The golden ratio. It pulls you into like the Mona Lisa's eyes. Mm-hmm. So 
I try and that's sort of engraved in my thinking yeah. when I look at photos. Does it have that golden ratio? Is it composed well? Are the colors right with the foreground and background? So with me, I think I think a lot more about the detail of the foreground and the background as well as the subject in relation to each other because I shoot especially fashion 95% of the time it's very short depth of field mm -hmm. um who put that there <laughs> <laughs> so there's also like because you like then concert photography is a whole other thing because there's just five people like five subjects on stage doing whatever they want and mm -hmm. you have to make them look as good as you can yeah and then like they'll move and you're like well now my point of view is obsolete because they're like because now one was blocking another yeah. one or like oh yeah yeah you know it's like it, when i i shot a, got, got to shoot a lot of concerts like really big bands and it doesn't pay much but you got, got a great portfolio mm -hmm. and you always have this mic face it's like you know your lead singers at the mic but it, you know the mic's on this side of them and you know, you got to catch him when he's off mic or, yeah. or go way to the side, you know, because you can never get on stage. I mean, I have with bands that have hired me to, but not, you know, when you're shooting a concert, you get three songs, you got to nail it and those three songs or get out. Yeah. Well, I think uh, like you talked about, you know, Renaissance era, you know, painting and Leonardo da Vinci. And I think um, I'm interested as to what about... Ren the Renaissance era or just Da Vinci in, in general? Well, da Vinci was an anomaly, but the whole concept of, of uh, coming to the light from the darkness, mm -hmm. the dark ages and waking up to this whole new world, reinvent yourself every morning. And I don't know, Da Vinci was definitely an anomaly. I personally think he was an alien. <laughs> you could are there, there i've heard arguments about that i mean you know people say oh if there's one dead person you'd like to meet i'm like leo da vinci oh yeah, yeah for sure <laughs> like you know there's probably Jimi hendrix would be cool mm. i think there was a lot more depth to that guy than than you know people thought he was a stoned out freaking musician mm -hmm. but he was a brilliant jazz player he was just a brilliant guy yeah um but yeah, the Renaissance, you know, it's just what it represents. Because when you communicate words, photos, everything, it's a symbol of something you're trying to say, you know, with a poem, trying to hit you in the nose with a point in your ears. What, uh, but, you know, the whole concept of coming into the light from the darkness or like waking up, you know, a lot of when you look at the Gaia channel and Curiosity Stream, it's all about yeah. the quest to wake the hell up, man. Mm -hmm. They're out there. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think that, you know, obviously through that period, then a lot of amazing art came out of that. Oh, my and God. People being in that Vokio, mind, so. yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I, I just had a strange infatuation with Da Vinci for a long time. I got to work a little bit on his horse, Il, Il Cavallo project, mm -hmm. which a guy re- it was his going to be his the biggest bronze sculpture of the time in the turn, uh, Renaissance for mid 1400s. He was commissioned to build a, you know a horse on one leg, and it was a huge bronze statue. And he actually built a clay model of it, but he never got to build it because the French took over uh, Italy and mm. used his clay statue for target practice with their bow and arrow and took it down but there was a lot of drawings reference drawings of you it. imagine like yeah it, your, your client gets taken over by another country so you don't get paid <laughs> and super well, weak. He, he ended up going to france and being commissioned by the french you know I've, uh, <laughs> i forget the guy's name where he was nobody really knows where he died or where he's buried but mm -hmm. they think it's in a little town north of paris which i had the pleasure of visiting um but uh yeah the idea of uh waking up the, the renaissance yeah. and what it symbolizes is great and there was some i mean i don't know of any painters today and i don't really follow art that much i'm more of a doer than a watcher yeah, than, yeah. than a voyeur but uh i don't know of anybody that could be compared to rembrandt or da vinci or vocchio or any of those classical artists and i'm also really into plato and uh, socrates yeah I'm not surprised. Yeah, I can. You know, just hearing kind of how you know you look at a lot of things. I mean, that yeah. makes sense. That's yeah. a, that's also a good. Uh, I mean, you're a good illustration of how that stuff's still actually relevant. Yes. Because sometimes you read it and it's like I don't understand how this really applies. Mm -hmm. It's all kind of abstract. But if you like, oh, <laughs> now you did it. Oh, no. 
the bolts right there. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> you're, you're not uh, the first person. That's okay. You're not the first. You're not the first. He just somehow unhook the mic. Is is he not the first person to unhook the mic from the? Pretty sure. Oh, is is it first guess though to unhook the mic from? I always got to play around. Got to play around. Then somebody gets their eye poked out. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna touch it. You're no. going down. You're going down the books for that one though. Yeah, that's a clip. <laughs> that's a clip for financially. Sure. <laughs> 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 so what would Socrates say about that? <laughs> um, you know, no, one, one of my favorite things that he said, they would talk about these uh, things. And this is one of, just one of my favorite things. Uh, they'd have these circles, these intellectual conversations over mm-hmm. dinner, and they were talking about love. And this guy would say, oh, love is about the the union of the circle of two people becoming one and the ultimate love, the amore, not agape or, or mm-hmm. eros, but the um, ultimate, our souls blend together. And Socrates and gets up and says, you know, that's really cool. It sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe love is about, are you ready for this? Mm-hmm. The desire for immortality through procreation. That's pretty bio, crazy. From a biological Think standpoint, about that's that. pretty true. Yeah, it? yeah. Right? You want to yeah. live forever through your children. So yeah. you want to have find a beautiful wife, have children, and that's your your family mm. tree going on. That's the desire crazy. for immortality through procreation. It's crazy wow. that those dudes were so intelligent and lived in the time period that they sure. did. The and it makes of... me feel very stupid whenever <laughs> yeah. I read anything they say on a yeah. bad day, like any yeah. writing they made no, on I'm a bad you. day. Like uh, I don't better. know what came over with me when I was a kid. I, I had a friend whose older brother was obsessed with books. He was mm-hmm. really smart. And this guy like left high school a year before he was graduated, quit. And he went to New York City, lived with two lesbians. I'm talking 60s. Yeah. And wow. he ended up working for for Playtex and we would go visit him. He always had models around. So it was a big kind of inspiration to me. But um, um, so, yeah, so these guys were really smart. But this guy had all these books in his parents' house where I would go once in a while. And I ended up going and buying books on Sigmund Freud, you know, the theories, series of psychotherapy or something like that and try and understand it. But I would read it, but I was like, I don't get this at all. Why am I even reading this? I'd go mm-hmm. on to Alan Watts, or, you know, poetry yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Um, but Socrates uh, and, you know, things like that are, you can relate more, you know. But yeah. So we're, uh, we're coming up on the end here. And yeah. I know you brought a poem. I brought if a you, bunch, but I don't, you know, like they're short and sweet, but I don't know if I want to, you know, are you guys down with that? I mean, I'm, I'm down. Yeah, I'm down. Oh, yeah. if, if you're all good, I think we're we've all good. Ta- I, we've never had anyone come on the show and read poetry. Yeah, I don't, and think so. the, I don't know. I, I, and poetry has I mean. been, and it's like uh, people sleep on it, especially now. Like, I think more than ever, like poetry is just getting less and less important to people mm-hmm. in the art scene. And like, I think it's still really important. I, you know, for me, it's the doing it that it, it's just like, the, again, like mm-hmm. this thing, I got to do it. I, you know, yeah. I, I want people to like it, but, you know, I'm so prolific at it. So, you know, when I, when I won this award, I wanted to kind of freak people out in my video. I made reference to that. My friend Kip, the painter, he said, don't be afraid. And I was like, you're going to be afraid. Man. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to kick your butt. <laughs> um, but so, you know, and that's why I, I also wanted to show versatility. So I ended up with the poem that I'll get to in the middle. Or no, I'll, I'm going to start with and see if you want to do another one. Okay. Um, so it's just kind of like, you know, at this point, just want to kind of have that like, what the heck? Yeah. Who is that guy? Yeah. You know, instead of, I'd like to thank my mother and my mother's mother and her mother and my sister and brother. It's and weird with acceptance speeches. For <laughs> yeah. Acceptance speeches, they go up and they just tell the entire story for some reason. It's and they like, go way not, over the two yeah. minute line. Like, why, not, yeah. why not leave yeah. some mystery so they're still interested instead yeah. of being like, yeah. Here, I was born in 1985. It's like, <laughs> yeah. well, like what's the point? Absolutely. You know, and I, I, again, that was my whole mission in getting up there and doing that. And I, I did a good job. I actually left out one important line in the poem because I was nervous as hell. Yeah. But then, you know, I just, it was the end of the thing, you know, I, I just like threw the paper and walked off and they were like, ah, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that guy? <laughs> 
<laughs> and the yeah, next got, guy got up and gave a 30 minute acceptance speech. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I actually judged this year's competition mm. and a guy named Mike Krasukas won, who I love. He's a guitar player. Mm. I nominated him and um, he won. And I, I was, I said, look, I got to talk really fast because I only have like 30 seconds. I was strictly informed. Oh, I got to do this presentation in 30 <laughs> seconds. But Mike, I'm going to cheat on that and I'm going to take two minutes and he deserves 15 minutes to kind of reflect on his achievements. It mm-hmm. was a lifetime achievement award. They want to get it in 30 seconds. So That's, it was yeah. kind of like, you know, I got to do the other guys, but I'm going to cheat and I'm going to really talk about this guy. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And then what it, a maverick move. <laughs> and you know, I was the first one, but it was just like, I'm in the audience sipping wine. I'm like, oh. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the girl I was with like nudging me. She's like, Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> You're snoring really loud. I don't mean to diss it. It was very <laughs> legitimate awards. <laughs> All right, FIFA, we got that. that. Yeah. Right, what's I'm not going to say anything bad about anybody, <laughs> but... Right. So I'm going to jump into this. and it. Uh, see what you guys think, seriously. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's kind of, I don't know, a little defiant. I don't know what the hell I was thinking when I wrote this, but here we go. Lying down my sword, I will never give up the fight. Trying a new approach, I digress. Then I will slay the enemy slowly with kindness. In my dreams, I have wings. I write songs that go through your soul. Some fueled by the fear of becoming some dude you used to know. Break me out of this burning house. I just needed a place to hide. Why must I fall asleep to dream? Wow. Wow. I did that. I try and get, I mean, to the point and short yeah. and sweet. Uh-huh. You yeah. know what I mean? You want to hear another one? Sure. Yeah. Hit it. I, they're all pretty short. I, I love short poetry. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, My favorite. I don't, again, know what this was about. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounded good to me. Whose idea was this? <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote this on my bedpost last night when I was sleeping? Because <laughs> most of these, like, really, they're like uh, 15, 20 minutes. I'll spend another half hour tweaking it. Yeah. And then uh, it's in the archives. Okay. <laughs> And I don't really label them unless I'm going to do a book or something like Mm. that. Okay. Everything I've ever loved, carelessly thrown into the sea at night. All my dreams, my fears, and all the light reflecting in the sea at night. I am lost and found, staring deeply down into the sea at night. Waves under waves, I am ultra alive, and I dive into the sea at night. Yo, I want to talk about something really quick. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, yeah. but um, one of my favorite things that happens in poetry is repetition. Yeah. Because, and especially in poetry, more so than any other piece of prose or writing or whatever, um, you know, the, the words you choose are so important and you have such a limited amount. So the repetition is there for a reason, man. Absolutely. So I love that. Thanks. Yeah, I really Thanks. Like that and, you know, it's funny because I turn into this weirdo poet guy when I'm reading it. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's well, like when I'm writing it, it's got to have that flow, yeah. that jam, you know, that, that thing. So I got three more. The last one's kind of long, but we'll get through it. Do we have time? Uh, we got like three more minutes. Oh, yeah. Plenty of time. All right. <laughs> Dude, I won't get interject. The so. No, no, it's okay. I, I love right. the feedback. I really do because I'm sensitive about my poetry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't. I wrote this one really quickly, and again, it's, uh, it was. Um, I'm not sure what it means. Welcome to the jungle. Now try to get out alive. Live your fantasy life, but all that's important is to survive. Don't die. Claw your way out. I will not kill unless my gun tells my heart to pull the trigger. A slow motion blink in your eyes. There's fire. A good chance to be. Live or die. You will never see life this way again so take a deep breath and survive I'm gonna run right into this one you go for it hit it yeah i don't remember writing that <laughs> <laughs> uh this apparently is about a girl <laughs> <laughs> i don't know maybe that last one was too i don't know <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> give me a glance, a signal, a chance for hope. I know you're hurt. I won't ask. Your secrets are sacred. 
for the rest of time. It seems so easy. Let's make a movie. I wrote this story called You and Me, a sweet love story called You and Me. The second you left, I cried for days. Then you came back. I think you forgot your keys. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's great. I'll leave them for you guys when I'm, you know, borrow them or something. Um, okay, I got one more. And it's funny because I, like, two years ago, I uh, was showing some artwork in a studio, uh, yeah, gallery in Allentown, and they had an open mic poetry thing. It was, like, the first time I ever got up and read anything. And I was like, people were doing this. Like, yeah, but I really nice. got it. And, man, there were some chicks that were doing this, this emphatic poetry. It was just so cool. It was like, I was like, wow, I'm so glad to be part of this. So now I, I'm more comfortable doing it and I try and grasp the opportunity to, to read in, in coffee shops or something like that. Mm -hmm. But this one's kind of funky cool, but uh, you'll, you'll decide for yourself what it's about. It's called, this one is called Machine Oil. In fact, you know what? Let me take another 10 seconds. Glasses are coming on. Oh, glasses, are glasses. Yeah, man. I want to nail this one. It's a closing <laughs> thing, man. I want a standing ovation. <laughs> Machine oil is what I mean. Whatever the words I choose. I mean, I need, I want, I am to be. Machine oil. Everything is squeaky, frictiony, and leaking, causing a mess in unnecessary places. We all may just self-destruct over or under pressure to perform. I need impressive results on a stress test. In my fascination for lubrication, Machino Royale, the ultimate smooth, quiet, and precisely tuned, alternatively fueled like a cool down tempo groove, no waiting for the day I feel better. A million lifetimes I will be the oil in the machine that drives me. Wow. Yo. <laughs> Thanks, I man. can't get up, unfortunately. No, you guys are wired. Chandler, yeah. Yeah, Chandler stood up. Oh, yeah, if Pat and I stand up, the whole studio will fall down. <laughs> so we're wired directly in. So. Right. Unplugged, yeah. shit falling from. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Pete, thank you so much. No, really, it was my pleasure. Thanks for uh, whatever the exposure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for not suing me for breaking the mic. Oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, Allegedly. Uh, I don't, Allegedly. Yeah, I don't jump the gun on that one. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming on. <laughs> and uh, this is the Poorly Edited Podcast. Signing out. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Pete. Ciao for now. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for uh, putting up with us. All right. And uh, just the music is by Food Truck today. So check them out and have a great night.